Good morning. So great to see everybody. So glad we can worship God together this morning. As you probably know, maybe don't know, I know for most of us Floridians it's not a big deal, but there's some kind of storm out there in the Gulf of Mexico as we speak. And my favorite meteorologist was talking this morning about how people should stay inside on Sunday. And I just remember thinking, um, you know, he must not know that it's the Lord's day. And we do have some important things to do, and a little bit of rain is not going to stop us. So I'm glad, glad you're here and so glad that we can be together today. If you're here in part because you received a postcard similar to the one on the screen, we really are glad that you're here. And I want you to know we haven't just been writing to you, we've been praying for you. And the fact that you're here with us this morning just fills our heart with joy. And we're so glad to see you. Today is our Come Home Sunday, where we reached out to our brothers and sisters in Christ we haven't seen in a while, and we're so glad to have a handful with us this morning who have uh, decided to be here in attendance to worship our Father all together. When you talk about coming back home, and since that is the Sunday that we're focused on this Sunday, August 4th, as our Coming Back Home Sunday, I want us to look at, in the Bible, an example of somebody who came back home and learn from him and from his story that Jesus shares with us in Luke 15. So if you have a Bible, if you'd like to follow along, I do hope you'll turn to Luke 15. And we're going to look at a section, not the entirety of it, but we are going to look at a section of a parable that's sometimes referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. But as you're turning there in Luke 15, I want to share with you, when I was growing up, one of my favorite movies was The Wizard of Oz. And I, had, I didn't know back then that there was a book, and it was based on a book. But that movie, that old movie, I remember I loved watching it. And as a kid, there were certain aspects to me that really jumped out about it. And I'm, there are going to be some spoiler alerts here, but this movie's been out long enough. I think we're past the statute of limitations on that. Um, but I remember watching The Wizard of Oz, and there were some parts of it that really scared me. For example, the tornado, you know, that's a pretty scary thing. I remember the flying monkeys and just being terrified of the flying monkeys. The witch, of course, with the green skin. You know, that's never a, uh, never a good look. But um, as a kid, it was just entertaining. I didn't really understand what the moral of the story was, right? But I remember watching it after I'd grown up a little bit and watching The Wizard of Oz and realizing that there's really one main moral to that story. And we see it in Dorothy, the main character, and how before the tornado does or doesn't take her away, depending on whether or not that was all a dream, before that situation where she's transported to the land of Oz, she hates home. She's discontent with it. She's bored with it. She resents her family members. She resents the humdrum day in, day out of living in Kansas. And she wishes she could be somewhere else. And then she's transported somewhere else. And then she begins to realize that somewhere else isn't everything that she thought it would be, or could be, or should be. And as she's somewhere else, eventually, you know, she, of course she looks to Toto when they're there, and she says, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, right? That's the famous line, of course. But as she's there in the land of Oz, she grows more and more homesick. And as the movie progresses, as the story progresses, she just wishes she could go home. And finally, she gets those ruby slippers. And that's really the whole point of the movie. They get these ruby slippers so that she can click her heels and so that she can say three times, there's no place like home. And those slippers will transport her right back to the place that she once disdained. And when she gets home, when she wakes up, when she gets back to Kansas, when she gets back to her black and white life, she is so thankful and she's hugging everybody and kissing everybody and is so glad to be outside of the land of Oz and to be able to come back home. And The Wizard of Oz, though it's a great movie, a great story, I think that sometimes we make the same journey spiritually. And we become discontent with our spiritual home. We be, start to seek something different. We leave, sometimes only to later realize the need to return. And the parable of the prodigal son here in Luke chapter 15 gives us great insight, not only into the need to come home, to come back, not just to church, not just to worship services, but to come back to our Father. It illustrates that need, but it also demonstrates to us how we can and what we can expect when we do come home. 
So from this parable in Luke 15, we're going to note three things about coming home and pray that if, if you are coming home today or you need to come home today, that you will take up our awesome father on his invitation to come back to him and to be in his household once again. The first thing we're going to notice about coming back home from Luke 15, beginning in verse number 11, is we're going to notice that coming back home after coming to ourselves. Luke 15, verses 11 through 19. And the prodigal son here, this parable by Jesus, really gives us some great psychological insight. And Jesus, as the Son of God, as both man and God, has great insight into human nature. He knows what makes us tick. He knows why we think oftentimes what we think. He knows what is in man. The Bible tells us, and he didn't need anybody to tell him what anybody else was thinking because he already knew what was in the heart and mind of man. And in Luke 15, he gives us great insight into this son. In Luke 15, beginning in verse number 11, we see that the prodigal son, though this is a well-known parable, sometimes we forget that the prodigal son did not want to come home at first. That there were times where the prodigal son was away from home and it was enjoyable and he did have fun. And we see beginning in Luke 15 verse number 11 how this all sets up. Jesus tells us a certain man had two sons. We're not focusing on the second son today. We're focusing on the first son, the younger son. In verse 12 it says, The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. He's essentially asking for his inheritance ahead of time. Something that could be done usually for a lesser amount, and the father obliged. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, he journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. That word prodigal just refers to this idea of wasteful, wasteful living. He wasn't keeping track of his dollars and his cents, if you will. He is spending all of his money. Now I have to imagine this young man had some fun spending all of his money. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you had some money. I remember being young, and maybe I did a little yard work project or something for a family member, and maybe I had some money, and that money was just burning a hole in my pocket. Have you ever been in that situation? And I remember going, maybe it was just a convenience store, and I remember buying like 10 sodas, right? I don't need 10 sodas, but I want to spend that money. So this young man's in that situation. He spends all this money, verse 13 tells us. He was a young man with full pockets. Nothing was on the horizon but possibilities, and he was having a good time. The last thing on his mind was going back home. He had no need to go back home. He had no desire to go back home, but things changed, as things often do in life. And in verse 14, we read that when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. Now, famine, we, we, I think insurance adjusters would call that an act of God. But a famine is something that you really can't look forward and see. Nobody has a crystal ball that can tell you when a famine will arise, especially not back then. They didn't really have the irrigation practices we have today. They didn't have the soil chemistry we have today. They were completely dependent upon a number of, res a number of factors completely outside of their control to grow food, to eat, and live. And a famine arose. And the Bible tells us that when that severe ca famine came, look at verse 14, he began to be in want. Things had changed. He had no want. All of his wants were met. Not just his needs, but his wants. All of his wants were met. He had everything he could ask for. He had spent all his money. But things changed, as they often do. And now he was in want. And we see that this really is just the beginning of the difficulty. In verse 15, we read that he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. What's the country? We don't know. But we know it probably wasn't Israel. And here's why. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, I don't know about you, I love bacon. I love it. I remember as a kid waking up to the smell of bacon. I mean, that's like the best thing in the world. Amen. And going, thank you, brother. <laughs> Leaving your bedroom, going to the kitchen, and there's just a pile of bacon sitting there, right? But in the Jewish mind, because the Old Testament had outlawed the consumption of pork, there is nothing worse you could do almost, nothing grosser, Nothing more unclean you could do than raise swine. If you're a pig farmer, you pretty much know, okay, you're not a Jew. You're unclean. You're really low down. But notice that this young man, 
joins himself to a pig farmer, and that's his job. He has to go out and feed the swine. Maybe if, you know, in America, we would say he has to go out and slop the hogs, right? That's his job. He has to go feed these swine. And notice verse 16, how hungry he is. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. He was so hungry, he wanted to eat the pig food. Now, I've been hungry. I don't think I've ever been that hungry. To want to eat the food that they're feeding the pigs. But it's in this situation, it's at this moment, that a change in his thinking occurs. Look at verse 17. There, hungry, in the pigsty, away from home, Jesus says, but he came to himself. It was like he woke up from a dream. He was living a life that he knew better than to be involved in. And it's at that moment, after the money was gone, after the famine came, after he's in the pigsty, after he's hungry, it's in that moment that for him, it clicked. And he realized, what am I doing here? And that's what that word, that phrase means, to come to yourself. It means that he suddenly had a realization. And it it led to a change in thinking. It led to a change in his actions. It led to a new resolve, and now he wasn't content to sit there and feed the pigs. He comes to himself, and notice what he says. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. What is he saying? The slaves in my father's household have it better than I do. What am I doing? I will arise, verse 18. I will go to my father, and I will say to him. He begins to rehearse what he's going to say to his dad. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation where you've had to rehearse what you're going to say to your dad. It's usually not a good place to be. But he's rehearsing. What am I going to say when I get there? He sa- he's going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven. He's a religious man. He grew up religious, at least. He knows that there is a heaven above. There is a God there. And in the Jewish mindset, when you refer to heaven, you're referring to God. But God is so revered. You can't say God, so you refer to where God is. He says, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So what's his spiel? What's his speech that he performed for his dad or is planning to perform for his dad? He says, Dad, you don't have to take me back as a son. Just take me back as a slave. Just put me in the house on the back of the property. Give me a loaf of bread and I'll do whatever work you ask me to do. I'm so down on my luck. I've drifted so far. I'm so hungry. If you just make me one of your lowly servants, that would be great. And we see something here that I think applies not just to this young man in this story that Jesus gives, but applies oftentimes across the board. And that is, oftentimes when we drift spiritually, it takes something for us to come back. And that something is, we have to come to ourselves. Most people only come home after they've come to themselves. Once we've come to our senses. And it was a phrase, it was like a a catchphrase in Jesus' day, this idea of coming to yourself. And it meant to suddenly, radically change your mind and your actions, to stop doing something unwise and to start doing something wise. And maybe you've had an experience where you've come to yourself. When you were doing something, no, you shouldn't have been doing. And you ignored all the warning signs. And now it seems like you're in too deep. And you want to back out. And maybe it feels like you can't. And in that moment, you realize how big of a mistake you've made. God has a way in his providence of creating situations in which people can more easily come to themselves. And that might seem odd to us, but I want you to consider that For the prodigal son, son, that situation where the circumstances were easier for him to come to himself, that situation was the pigsty. And he didn't know it at the time, but that pig pit was actually the mercy of God on display. And you might say, well, wait a second. If God's good to me, why doesn't he give me everything I want? If God's good to me, why doesn't he allow me to to be full and to have my money and to not be here slopping the hogs? But God's mercy was on display driving him to a place in which he was motivated to come to himself and to change his ways. And maybe, and this isn't just 
for some people, even if you are here in this church building every single week, maybe you today, you're here because you've come to yourself. And if that's true, and if you've come back to your senses maybe, and you realize, I have to make God more of a priority. And maybe you realize, I need to worship God. I need to be with God's people. I need to be back with the Lord's church that the Lord added me to. I need to get back to that life, back to that commitment that I made to Christ. Whenever you made that commitment to Christ, when you put him on in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. And you've come to yourself and you're stating, I need to be here. I need to come back home. I need to come back to the arms of my father. I want you to know that there's no better place that you could be right here and right now than where you are. To come to your senses and to say, I need my father in heaven. The prodigal son came back home because he came to himself, but what did he come back home to? And the rest of this lesson is going to focus on two things that the prodigal son came back home to. And if you come back home to the Lord today, if you have that need, these same two things will be present for you. What did he come back home to? You know, what you're coming home to makes all the difference. Maybe you have at some point in your life, or maybe every week this is your life, maybe you spend a long day at work. You know, if you've spent a long day at work, what you are expecting or what you know to come back home to makes all the difference. If you spend all day at work and you, are, you know you're coming back home to a loving family, that makes a big difference. If you spend all day at work and you know you're coming back home to your favorite meal, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Your drive home is a little happier. If you spend all day at work and you know you're coming home to a relaxing evening with a loved one, that's exciting. You want to go home. But what if you are coming home and you know that you were coming home to get chewed out? What if you're coming home after a long day away and you're coming home and you know that you're coming home to more work? You couldn't get it all done at work and you're going to be working all night at home. What if you spend all day away and you're coming back home and you're coming back home and you know you're coming back home to a huge fight? Are you as eager? Are you as excited? Do you feel as good about it? There's no way. What we're coming back home to makes all the difference in the world. It did for this prodigal son, and it will for us as well. So what do we if, we, if we come back home to the Lord, what are we coming back home to? I want us to pay attention to what the prodigal son and what every soul who has been added to the church wanders away and then comes back home is coming back home to. These two things. And the first is this. When we're coming back home, we're coming back home to a loving father. We're coming back home to a loving father. Notice the father's interaction with the son when he comes back home. And it tells us something about God. In this parable, in this story, this father is meant to represent our heavenly father. He's meant to represent the God that we serve. And notice how the heavenly father reacts to the son when he comes home. Notice there in Luke 15, verses 20 through 22, the first thing we're coming home to is a loving father. And we see this in these short verses. We see the father's love in a couple of different ways. Look at verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Just in that short verse, we see the father's love in a multitude of ways. Notice in the first place with me how the Bible records in this story of Jesus that when the son was still a great way off, his father saw him. And you might read that and think, well, that's coincidence. You know, sometimes you're doing something and you just happen to look up and see something. You know, that happens sometimes. But I want to submit to you that this was not coincidence. I want to submit to you something different. That this father was on the lookout for his son. And throughout his day, I bet he had times in his day for however long his son was gone, I bet he had times in his day where he stopped what he was doing and he went up on that hill right outside of his property and he looked out waiting to see if he could see his son coming back to him. Maybe daily, maybe multiple times a day, he would just scan the horizon to see 
if his son was coming back. One of those days he was, so the father was able to see him from a long way off. But it's not only that. The Bible says that when he saw him, he had compassion. Have you ever seen somebody in just their sight? Let's be honest here. Have you ever seen somebody in just the sight of them made you angry? Or maybe you see somebody and just the sight of them makes you scared. Of all the emotions, of all the feelings the father could feel when he sees the son who ran away and wasted all of his money, money that the father gave him, of all the feelings, of all the words you could express, used to express the emotions that the father's going to see the first time he sees his son coming back after God knows how long, of all the words you could have used, you know what the word Jesus used? He said, compassion. When the father saw his son coming back, the same son who had left, the same son who had betrayed him, the same son who had squandered his money that he worked hard for, when he saw that son return, he didn't have anger. He didn't have resentment. He didn't feel bitter. What he felt was compassion. And this word in the Greek refers to something that you feel in your gut. It refers to something you feel in the pit of your stomach. And when the father saw him, it was like he was getting punched in the stomach, not because he was mad, not because he was angry, not because he was resentful, but because he cared so much for him. And you have to imagine that when this son was coming back, he wasn't coming back with the nicest clothes on. In fact, we read that the father had to give him shoes for his feet. He was barefoot. He was covered in pig slop. He was probably 30, 40 pounds lighter than the last time he had seen him. And the emotion he felt was compassion. His father loved him. But it's not just feelings. Notice the actions. He saw him from afar off. He had compassion on him. That's the first emotion he felt when he saw him. But notice what he does. He runs to him. There in verse 20, he saw him afar off. He had compassion and he ran. There's an article we actually mailed out in our house to house, heart to heart that we mailed out. And it was titled, The God Who Runs. And the author of that article brought out a great point. And it was for men to run at that time, unless there was a battle, unless there was a protection that needed to be made. It was a very unusual thing. And it was a very hard thing. You know, they wore these long robes back in those days. You had to lift those up, gird those up so that you could run. I don't know when the last time you ran was, but it exerts quite a bit of energy. It's something that you have to decide to do. And when this father saw his son, he picked up his cloak, he girded it up, and he ran. What did he run to do? Did he run to smack him outside the head? Some of us had dads like that. Did he run to chew him out? Did he run to scold him? Did he run asking him for his money back with interest? What did he run to do? He ran to fall on him and to kiss his neck, the Bible tells us. He was so excited to see his son coming back home. And you see this outburst of emotion. You see this outpouring of emotion. We see the love that the father had for him, but it doesn't stop there. Keep reading in verse 21. The son is going to give his rehearsed speech. The son says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. What do we have? We've got a confession. We've got a statement of contrition, a statement of repentance. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I've sinned, not only against God, but against you. Now, if you're that dad, how would you respond? What does the father do? Does the father say, yes, yeah, son, you're right, and I'm going to make you pay for it? Does the father say, how dare you come back here with your cheap apology that you rehearsed on the way and try to think that you could come back into my household? The father doesn't say that. In fact, the father doesn't say anything to the son. He only speaks to the servants. And notice what he says there in verse 22. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. What is he communicating? He's communicating, you're not going to be my servant. You're coming back as my son. Put the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. What is that ring? That ring was a signifier that I'm a member of this family. 
That ring was a signifier that I am my father's son. Put this ring on his hand and put sandals on his feet. Notice, think about how much that son thought about that little speech. What do you think he thought his dad was going to say? Yeah, okay, you can be one of my servants, but that's it. And of all the things the father could have done, maybe we would argue should have done. When the father sees him, has compassion on him, hugs him, kisses him. When the son says, hey, I've done wrong. I'm repenting. I'm coming back home. And the father doesn't respond to him. What he does is he tells his servants to come and bring out the best that he has to clothe his son. The father does not lash his son. He lavishes him. He brings out the best he has so the son can wear it and be a member of his family again. There was no guilt trip. There was no scolding. There was no rehashing of mistakes. There was no record of wrongs that was read. And we ought to realize that when Christians who have wandered away come back, they likewise come back home to a loving father. And when we come back home, with that contrition, with that confession, with that recognition of we have wandered, we have gone astray, we have sinned, We're coming back home to a father who is on the lookout, eagerly awaiting our return. We come back home to a father who has compassion, who cares deeply for us even in our lowest moments. Even when we feel like we're the farthest away from him, he's still actively caring for us. A father who runs to meet us and kiss us. A father who demonstrates to us a love in action. And that's what God does. We all know John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten son so that we could be saved. A father who wants to lavish us, not lash us. Who wants to elevate us, not to get even with us. That's the father we serve. And so when this son comes home, he gets the robe, he gets the ring, he gets the sandals. And I want you to know that if you're coming home today, you're coming home to a loving father. A loving father who's been looking for you. A loving Father who has compassion on you. A loving Father who loves you. And who has demonstrated and will demonstrate his love for you. But that's not it. The prodigal son came home after coming to himself. He came home to a loving Father. But more than that, he was coming back home to a celebration. He was coming back home to a celebration. The Father's not done ordering his servants around. Notice, not ordering his son around, but ordering his servants around and notice what else he has to say to his servants beginning in verse 23 bring the fatted calf here and kill it let us eat and be merry what's the significance of the fatted calf the fatted calf was reserved for special occasions I don't know if you have anything you reserve for special occasions you might have I don't know a china cabinet that never gets opened Maybe if the king of England came and had dinner with you, you'd you'd break some of that out. I don't know. But we know that we reserve things for special occasions. And in this culture, at this time, it was the fatted calf. This is the calf that gets extra food. This is the calf that we're getting nice and plump so that he'll be nice and tasty. If you know anything about steaks, if you know anything about steaks, you know that there's something. Everybody who knows something about steaks, they all look for the same thing in a good steak. And it's called marbling. And the marbling is just the presence of fat among the muscle tissue. That's a fatted cow. That's what makes a good steak. So they're bringing out the fatted calf. This is the best of the best. This is the the reserve. This is the dry age, USDA, whatever. This is the best we have. And we're going to cook it for our son. Notice what he says. Bring out the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and be merry. Let's celebrate. Now you have to imagine, what was the son's expectation of what his father would say? Some of us are worst case scenario kind of people. I fall into that trap sometimes. Where I think, man, if I, if, what's going to happen to me if I, if I do this? And maybe he was thinking the worst case scenario. What's going to happen to me? Remember, he's at the end of his rope. He has no other option. He's going back home and he's probably wondering, what is my dad going to say? What is he going to do? And what his dad does is he throws a party for him. We're going to get the fatted calf. We're going to eat. We're going to be merry. But notice the next verse, verse number 24. Why are you doing this, Dad? Why is the Father doing this? Why? Why call the servants to lavish him? Verse 24 tells us, For, because, this 
my son. Notice what he calls him, my son. It's still his son. This, my son, was dead and is alive again. Son, I thought you were dead. You were missing. And here you are. This, my son, was lost. We didn't know where you were. We didn't know when you were coming back. This, my son, was lost and now is found. And they began to be merry. When we repent from our wandering, when we come back home, when we come back to the Lord, we likewise return to a celebration. We return to a celebration. Everybody in this room, if you've wandered away from the Lord, everybody in this room who's a member at this congregation has been working, has been praying, has been hoping to see our brethren back here today, and we are going to celebrate. But it's not just on earth that there's going to be a celebration when we come back home. This parable, the parable of the prodigal son, is the third parable in a series of three parables really all about the same thing, about a sinner repenting, coming back. And notice what Jesus describes in the first parable in Luke 15. Look at verse number 7. The lost sheep that the shepherd goes and rescues and brings back. And Jesus says there in verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Notice what he says. There's joy in heaven when somebody who's been wandering comes back home. Look at verse number 10, the parable of the coins. This woman had lost coins, probably part of her dowry, part of her wedding ceremony and celebration. And she's looking for these coins, this, this coin rather, one coin of the 10. And notice in verse 10, after she's found it, she calls her friends in verse 9 to come and celebrate with her. And Jesus tells us why, verse 10, likewise, I say to you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What is he saying? Heaven celebrates when one of God's children comes back home. And the church, as an outpost of heaven on earth, as the body of Christ on earth, we celebrate as well. And what an awesome thought to think that if you've wandered from the Lord, if you're willing to come back today, that there could be a party in heaven for you. There could be rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God because the God who knows you by name, who knows the number of hairs on your head, knows that you've come back home. And just like this father was so excited, so happy, so glad when his son come back, came back home, our heavenly father will be just as thrilled, if not more so, and he will lavish you with the spiritual blessings that come with being in good standing with our God in heaven. So if you've made the decision to come back home or you've made the decision to come to yourself, I want you to know that you're coming back home to a loving father and a celebration. You're coming back home to a loving family, a family who misses you, a family who wants you to be part of their family once again. Life is too short and eternity is too long to spend it in the wrong place. If you've come to yourself and you're ready to come back to the Lord today, know that we are ready to wrap our arms around you. Know that our Heavenly Father is ready to lavish you with spiritual blessings. Won't you come home today? You won't regret it. You know, Dorothy was onto something when she said there's no place like home. And that's even more so for us as Christians who can come back to our loving Father. If you need to come back, you can make the second best decision of your life today, something you won't regret. And if you've never wandered away because you've never been home, you've never accepted the Father's first invitation, today's the day to do that, to know that you're coming home to a loving Father to be part of a loving family. If you have a need to come back home, we hope you will while we stand and sing this song. Aww.